We are continuing with the uh, atomic, atomic to continuum scale transition, and uh, we summarized an idea where we started essentially from a very general representation of the overall, uh, the total energy of a uh, atomic ensemble, and um, we made a number of simplifications, which eventually led to a uh, expression of the form where uh, the total energy is expressed approximately as the sum over the pair interactions. So I have n atoms and I'm summing over the interactions of the atoms. I'm counting every pair only once and uh, the interaction is of the form where I have a pair potential that is evaluated at the distance between the pair. Okay. Um, so now, this pair potential can eventually be chosen as uh, something that eventually is expected to give meaningful results, but we chose at the beginning, as, a, as, a, as, a, as one example, something very simple, a classical Leonard Jones uh, potential. And uh, then we eventually made a transition to the concept of the overall energy of the system, and we argued that, well, the overall energy if we invoke the so-called Cauchy-Born hypothesis, which maps uh, the relative position vector between two um, atoms from the reference to the current configuration through the macroscopic deformation gradient at that point. Uh, so if we make use of that assumption, assumption, we essentially argue that E is inherently a function of the macroscopic deformation gradient at that point. And um, from that, we made a transition to the macroscopic strain energy function, which is E divided by the referential volume of the um, crystal portion that we're analyzing. And from that, based on the concept of hyperelasticity, we deduced that we can actually calculate the stress that the crystal is subjected to if it is impose a deformation that's characterized through F, we can calculate that stress through that relationship. All right, so all of this fits very nicely to what we've covered before. And the eventually, uh, one advantage of essentially, and the goal of this topic is to highlight how some parameters that appear in this expression, or of course, in the expression for the strain energy, can actually be deduced implicitly from what you have invoked as your pair potential. So it's somewhat of a non-phenomenological approach, at least on the macro scale. Um, so now we'd like to carry on with the details of that calculation. So I'd like to explicitly derive the expression for the stress. And for this purpose, I don't want to draw the figure for uh, Cauchy-Born hypothesis once again. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to quickly go ahead and draw um, a figure uh, where, again, I'm going to assume something simple. I'm going to assume that I have somewhat of a uh, cubic repeating structure. So I'm drawing a grid, and on that grid, I'm going to indicate some positions of atoms. So the grid actually is large. Eventually, it extends. Uh, if you like, to infinity. Infinity meaning that I'm going to encapsulate a very large number of atoms in this uh, figure. Uh, I'm drawing only a certain portion of it. Okay? And I'm highlighting two atoms, let's say I and J. Okay? Now, we're going to make a number of arguments, essentially, to enable this calculation in a relatively, let me say, feasible manner, all right? And the argument is going to be the following. So I have, if you like, a huge crystal, theoretically extending to infinity about i or j, it doesn't matter. And then let's say I sit on atom i and look around and try to see what I, or depict what I observe. So around i, what you see, well, you have an atom i. And similarly, around j, you're sitting on atom J, and you try to see, you try to depict what you're seeing, and what you're seeing is a lattice that repeats itself to 
infinity. Okay? Now, when you sit on J, you don't see anything different. You also see a lattice that extends to infinity. If I had taken something tiny, if that was the, it was the size of the crystal piece I was looking at, then if I look at I, I see a boundary this far away. If I sit on J, I see a boundary this far away. The picture would look different. But what I'm now saying is that let's consider a very, very large piece of the crystal. And in that sense, as far as the eye can see, there is no difference whether I sit on I or J. So the picture is going to be similar. And I'm doing a very quick job here just to indicate that. Um, the picture looks similar whether I sit on I or, or J. So that's the message here. So in a, let me say, a perfect crystal. Now what does it mean perfect? So perfect infinite crystal uh, with no defect. So there could have been a defect near I and no defect de near J like a dislocation. In that case, the picture near I would also be different than the picture near J. But I'm assuming perf perfect scenario. So in a perfect crystal, uh, all atoms see a similar lattice around itself. Okay. So, and we are assuming a theoretically infinite lattice. So that's a requirement, if you like, for that argument. Now, in practice, it really doesn't have to be really infinite. Um, and of course, it's not. There is a finite number, but of course, the number is very large. And so this is an assumption that sort of um, helps alleviate some difficulties that would otherwise uh, be overcome, could be overcome with alternative approaches, but when I say it's infinite, then we don't have to worry about many details. All right, so then that's the argument, right? So now we're going to keep this in mind, and I'm going to go back to the evaluation of the energy. So when I now try to write, in fact, let me directly write down the strain energy function, which is the energy divided by the total volume. And let me, if you like, evaluate it first at a identity deformation gradient. So there is no deformation, no stretch, no rotation. So it's going to be 1 over V, uh, sum over the number of atoms, I, okay, in my crystal. And uh, so it's I, N, where now N is very large, right? I said it's infinite. Um, so then there is the one half that I'm going to take into that sum, and then I have another sum. Now to simplify that, I'm going to draw the picture once again. Okay, um, and I'm going to draw it like this. So this is our final crystal depiction. So I have my guidelines. Right? So normally here I would put a sum over j and then there would be rij. I want to simplify the notation a little bit. Let us take this to be the position of atom i. Okay? Um, and I'm going to pick this to be essentially, I'm going to regard it as a origin. And afterwards, when I look at the relative position vector pointing from I to some other atom. I'm not going to write J, but I'm going to simply increment that or indicate that with alpha. So I'm going to write here and just to make it explicit that now I'm uh, slightly modifying the notation, I'm going to write it like this. So with respect to the earlier notation, this stands for R, relative position vector, pointing from I, to alpha, okay? So I'm just picking a different notation to highlight the notational uh, simplification. Um, all right. Um, okay. Um, so in general, 
the picture that we see around every atom could be different. It doesn't matter whether it is different or not. So presently, with this slight simplified notation, I'm going to write for sum over i, alpha is not equal to i, um, evaluation of the pair potentials, which is going to be indicated as r, let's say, alpha. Okay. So r alpha will now be the magnitude of that vector. Now, however, we have already discussed that the picture that every atom sees is essentially the same. So what appears in the sum over i is the same for every atom based on that argument. So here I'm going to write same for every i. And since it's exactly the same sum appearing for every i, I don't need to carry out the sum. I can just multiply this with and that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So this is equal to n over v, 1 over 2, sum over alpha, phi tilde r alpha. Okay. And there now appears a term that is very similar to mass over volume, which would be density, but except the, the difference is that I don't have mass, but rather a number. Um, but let's call it something that is somewhat associated with density. This will be the number of um, atoms per unit referential volume. or referential atomic density. OK, good. So we have an um, expression that is somewhat um, simplified. So now the argument is, in that simplification, that every atom sees the same picture around itself. That might be initially true. But after deformation, if, if there is a high degree of non-uniformity in the deformation, what might end up happening is that after deformation, although initially they see the same picture due to the non-uniformity of deformation, the deformation here in the vicinity of i might differ significantly from the vicinity of j, and hence this picture may not anymore hold. But in the context of the Cauchy-Born hypothesis, because you project the deformation uniformly onto the microscale, if this argument initially holds, it will hold after deformation for sure as well. So the Cauchy-Born hypothesis also preserves this argument. So uh, this is preserved if uniform deformation is assumed. Right? Now, it might happen that it's also preserved under other circumstances, but for sure it is preserved when I assume uniform deformation. And that is what is important for our purposes because that's what we're developing our theory upon. Um, so it, when, when that is the situation, therefore, I might also write, I might be able to write the strain energy expression, but this time evaluated at any deformation gradient. And following the same argument, it's going to be beta naught, the referential atomic density, one half sum over alpha phi tilde evaluated not at referential distances, but at spatial distances, because now the position between the atoms have changed. So I'm going to put in small r alpha. And now, there you go. We have now 
uh, explicit and slightly simplified expression for what um, the strain energy is. And here it's important to invoke this uniformity in deformation through the cauchy born hypothesis, which reads like that, right? Which we've stated last time. Um, okay, good. So now essentially we have um, the expression for the strain energy. Now I can take derivatives with respect to the deformation gradient, which is implicitly appearing in that term, and find the stress. And I can even proceed further, and that is something we're going to do again, find the stiffness tensor that we can eventually evaluate, uh, or from which we can extract elastic constants. Um, all right, so there is um, a issue here, however. I've assumed that the crystal is huge, and therefore this sum is over a number that is very large. So if you try to calculate that term for such a large number of atoms, and if you want to do this over and over again, uh, it might turn out costly. But luckily in practice, from the arguments that we based or constructed phi tilde through, we know how it behaves. In particular, we know that phi tilde is something that decays to zero with diff distance, right? Uh, if the atoms are very far away, there is no interaction between them. So in practice, since the sum is evaluating, evaluated over atoms that lie in the, around the atom I, which now acts are as our, as our origin. Um, in fact, now the origin is any atom. It doesn't really matter that I call this I. I just draw, I just draw a lattice and pick one point to be the origin and start summing around it, right? I start summing around these atoms and then I include those atoms. I include the other atoms, but eventually their contributions will be so small that at some point I can safely stop because they are going to be adding, let me say, only, let's say the first few atoms add to uh, the points just, or values before the decimal point, and if I go to the hundredth circle, they'll be adding to the tenth digit after the decimal point. So why bother with those? So in practice, there will be some radius of influence. Using which you can decide on how far to extend that sum, in fact, at some point, you would employ a cutoff, okay? And that cutoff is actually not too far away. It extends only to a very short distance in practice. Um, so that sum can be calculated quite rapidly. All right, so now, we're not concerned with any such numerical difficulty, so in practice we can, in our minds, presently maintain that this sum is over as many atoms as you like for this thing to be accurate enough. Um, all right, so any questions so far? Then I'll proceed with the calculation of the stress. Right. So, now, it's the, this part is amazingly simple, actually. Um, so, let's calculate the components of the first Piola-Kirchhoff stress tensor derivative of the macroscopic strain energy with respect to the components of the deformation gradient. I have the expression for the strain energy, so it's beta on knots. Uh, one half sum over alpha. And now I'm going to take the derivatives of phi, and phi is implicitly a function of r alpha. And r alpha is, impl is a function of the components of the relative position vector, r alpha k. And r alpha k is implicitly a function of the components of the deformation gradient, Fia. And why is that? Well, because R alpha k is equal to Fk b, 
capital R alpha B. Okay? That's the cauchy born hypothesis. All right, so every one of these expressions, actually, these two expressions we've indicated before, this is nothing but phi prime evaluated at R alpha. Um, this here, it's a um, unit vector, R alpha k divided by R alpha. Okay, that's also something we've calculated before. And this term is something we can calculate now, derivative of that with respect to this. This is a constant, so I just need to evaluate the derivative of this with respect to that. It's equal to delta i k delta a b, right? So the derivative is zero unless both components match, and then r alpha b. And then I can use the substitution property on b as well as eventually on k and end up with, well, let me write that result over here. maybe this much, let's write it here. So it's R alpha I over R alpha, um, capital R alpha A. Okay. And what I see here, right, are the components of a two-point tensor with indices I and A. So this here is associated with one over R alpha, the vector R, bun, the vector capital R. So these are the components of that vector. And this is just a phi prime, and therefore what I see is that the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor is equal to beta naught over two, sum over alpha, phi prime divided by r alpha, small r alpha bun, capital R alpha. So now that we have the expression for the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor, uh, let us proceed with the other stress tensors. Okay? So we could, for instance, notice that, again, invoke or express the uh, Cauchy-Born hypothesis. And now uh, what I can do is I can take this f outside of the bun product. And I can write that term as F multiplying beta naught over 2 sum over alpha phi prime over R alpha, okay? Capital R alpha bun capital R alpha. And P is equal to F times the second Kolekirchhoff stress tensor, and therefore whatever is in these brackets must be equal to S. And there you go, we have a uh, expression for the second Kolekirchhoff stress tensor as well. In fact, we don't need to stop there. We can go even further, and what we can do is we can introduce the spatial atomic density, beta, um, and I'll do this in a manner that is similar to what we do for the mass density itself. So I've divided by J. And that's going to be the number of atoms in my sum, in my crystal, uh, in my crystal uh, divided by um, the spatial volume. And I also recall that T is equal to 1 over J F S F um, transpose. So now you can look at the expression that we have just derived for the 
second pillar kick of stress tensor. In fact, we have the expression for P as well, so F already appears there, that's P. Take F, move it inside the bond by taking its transpose now, so it becomes F transpose becomes F, operates on capital R, and delivers you small R, the spatial referential vector. And there is a J which will divide beta naught, and I will have beta. So the term is very, very similar to the second pillar Kirchhoff stress tensor, the expression for the Cauchy stress, but instead of beta naught, I have beta. And instead of capital R alpha as the vector that appears in the tensorial basis, I have the spatial relative vector. So now we have the expression for every stress tensor uh, that we've covered. You can, if you like, calculate the Kirchhoff stress tensor as well. Uh, it's going to be simply beta not times that. Uh, but Kirchhoff, first pillar Kirchhoff, second pillar Kirchhoff, and Cauchy are the important ones that we are usually interested in. Um, so now what I'd like to do is we do have the stress. And so therefore now, given any deformation gradient, I can go ahead and calculate right, the expression for um, the Cauchy stress, or for that matter, any other stress. But I might be interested in more. I am interested in extracting some elastic constants out of this expression. And what you should realize at this point is the relation that is invoked by the strain energy function, let's say in the form of the Cauchy stress, uh, is not necessarily isotropic at this point. In fact, um, this stress will inherit the symmetry, in other words, type of anisotropy that is invoked by your crystal structure. Okay? So if it's going to be orthotropic, it's going to come out to be an orthotropic behavior. But whatever it is, let me try to extract some elastic constants. Let's see how we can do that. And the way I'm going to do that is by referring to Again, the second pillar kick of stress tensor. I've written this, but let me go back to the second pillar kick of stress tensor. It's the same thing, but beta naught alpha phi prime r alpha capital R alpha capital R alpha. Okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increment the deformation a little bit. And when I increment the deformation a little bit, the stress will be incremented a little bit. Right? So this is the small change in the stress due to a small change in the deformation. Let me try to calculate what that is. So it's as though I'm going to take, so what I'm trying to do here presently is trying to calculate the incremental change in a function. Let's say it depends on x. It's going to be df dx times dx, right? So I'm going to do the same thing here. ds is ds incremented by the deformation gradient times an incremental deformation gradient. That's exactly what I'm going to write there. So therefore, at some point, I need to take the derivative of that expression with respect to its argument, which in this case is the deformation gradient tensor. So if I do that, it's going to be beta naught over 2. That's a constant sum over alpha. And now I need to take the derivatives of these with respect to r because that's what they're a function of, and then the derivative of r with respect to alpha, uh, with respect to f. f is a second order tensor. I already have a basis here, so what I'm going to eventually end up here is going to be something of fourth order multiplying or operating on a second order to give me a second order, okay? So that's all what all of this cal calculation is equivalent to. So first derivative with respect to its argument, okay? So one derivative r alpha squared minus the derivative of r alpha phi prime over r alpha. Um, sorry, I correct. r alpha squared. Okay. The basis r alpha 
upon r alpha. And the derivative of the vector itself, f df. Okay. So this whole thing is almost almost like um, df dx. Okay. And this is the increment that controls the function I'm analyzing, which in this case is s. Okay. Um, all right, so this term is something we have already analyzed okay, on the previous board, and we found out that it's equal to 1 over r alpha vector r alpha bun f okay, from the previous board. Okay. And now what I see is a second order tensor, scalar product, a second order tensor. Here I already have a second order tensor appearing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these into a fourth order tensor operating on a second order tensor because the rule is if you have a fourth order tensor operating on a second order tensor, the operation is like that. So there is a sum over the last two indices. So it's as though whatever has to do with this is comes into inner product with whatever has to do with that. So this, is, goes, this goes into inner product with that, right? So all of those will be a fourth order tensor. And that fourth order tensor is beta naught over two, sum over alpha, phi double prime r alpha squared minus phi prime r alpha cube, okay? And capital R alpha, Bon capital R alpha, bon R alpha, oh, I am sorry, I messed up here. I go back and make a correction. What we have from the previous board was this, okay? Sorry, not F. Okay, I proceed capital R alpha operating on df. Okay. So now we have actually a very important quantity in these brackets as our fourth order tensor, but to make it apparent, let me simplify it a little bit more. And I'm going to assume now that the deformation is small. So in other words, um, the distance between the atoms do not change appreciably. And I'm going to simplify this expression so that we only retain in DS whatever is linear with respect to that change. So that's the small deformation assumption. And that entails that whatever is in the brackets should be a constant. It should be independent of deformation because this is already first order in deformation for sure. Okay? So now, the way I'm going to simplify it is as follows. So first of all, um, well, let's write it here. First of all, R alpha is going to be approximately equal to the capital R1, and therefore the vector itself is approximately going to be equal to that. That's the first um, observation that's directly invoked by that. When these deformations are small, there is, only a one, there is only a single measure of stress, and that is going to be indicated with sigma. That's our infinitesimal stress tensor. Okay, that's a notational simplification. And then what I notice is that is the following. When I make a small deformation assumption, um, this is going to be also capital R alpha. Capital R alpha bond capital R alpha, it's like a second, it's a second order tensor, this portion. And when I dot it with a tensor that is generally not symmetric, because I'm taking a scalar product, and that's something we've argued before, I've noted explicitly this. Um, uh, and made use of it in a transition. Because it's symmetric, in a scalar product, it will extract the symmetric part of whatever it operates on. And the symmetric part of this is essentially 
increment of the infinitesimal strain tensor because df is dh, and the symmetric part of that is by definition d epsilon. Okay? So via symmetry, and when I say the symmetry, I refer to the symmetry of that, df goes to d epsilon. Okay? And therefore, now I make a transition to the next board where I can write down the simplified expression of that relation. And essentially we have d sigma equals a tensor, a fourth order tensor that appears in the brackets operating on d epsilon, all right? And this fourth order tensor, because the deformation is reversible, I'm assuming that I have only a elastic deformation that's implicitly implied by the fact that I have atoms and I have pair potentials that act like strings. If I slightly pull them apart and let go, they will come back to their initial position just like elastic deformation. Whatever lies in there has to be the stiffness tensor, the fourth order stiffness tensor. So this statement is equivalent to sigma equals C epsilon. And the expression for C is whatever I have in the brackets subject to the simplification that we have made. It's beta naught over two, sum over alpha, phi double prime over R alpha, sorry, capital R alpha, um, squared, minus phi prime over capital R alpha cube, bun, R alpha. And these derivatives, by the way, are also evaluated at these values R alpha. because that's the referential distance between the atoms. And that's a constant, right? So now if you actually invoke the uh, Cauchy-Born hypothesis in an infinitesimal deformation setting, you don't have to calculate the stress for any deformation. What you can do is you can calculate this tensor once on the referential configuration of the crystal and it only depends on the parameters associated with that referential configuration. And there you go. Afterwards, given any deformation that's infinitesimal, you can calculate any stress that is infinitesimal. You have the whole, inf the complete information that characterizes the macroscopic linear elastic behavior, and it's not, in general, isotropic. Okay? All right. So, um, now at this point, I'd like to take a pause and... Um, essentially remind you something about the macroscopic stiffness tensor, or in fact, about any stiffness tensor. So I'm going to add that note over here, and then subsequently continue with the analysis. So. The note pertains to actually something I said in linear, when we were talking about linear elasticity. In fact, I said I would show you something, and yesterday I realized when I was watching a video, watching the video of the lecture, I forgot to mention what I wanted to say. And it's very short, uh, and in fact, uh, it's, it's, it's now going to be quite easy because we've covered the concept of strain energy, even the infinitesimal expression when we were talking about the mechanics of soft material. So when I write the strain energy, it's equal to, for in the infinitesimal relative formation setting, one half uh, epsilon c epsilon, right? And in terms of components, that's equal to one half e i j c i j k l epsilon k l, right? Um, and if you want to drive the stress, you would take a derivative with respect to epsilon. So sigma is equal to del infinitesimal strain energy epsilon, right? And similarly, if you want to calculate the stiffness tensor, that would be the second derivative 
of the strain energy with respect to the strain or essentially the first energy of the stress with respect to epsilon because this is nothing but C epsilon. So if you carry that out, what you will find is that C i j k k l directly from that expression is equal to k l. And here we see two important things that we already said. What we had said was, well, this stiffness tensor is fourth order and there must be symmetry among the last two, first of all, indices because it multiplies something that is symmetric and if I switch the indices of these, the result shouldn't change and hence there must be symmetry in there, okay? And likewise, it delivers something that is symmetric, the stress tensor, the components of which don't matter, and therefore if I switch them, also there should be symmetry. And this way I told you, well, immediately you can get at most 36 independent constants, but I told you, well, that's not all. If you put them into a six by six matrix, actually that is also symmetric. Now the reason for that symmetry, I told you you could perhaps argue mechanically, um, but essentially we see it over here. Because if you now switch these, the result should not change because the order of differentiation with respect to epsilon really does not matter. Okay? So now you see that that 6 by 6 expression in a void notation uh, has to have at most independent, 21 independent components. This symmetry, switching of that with that, is called a major symmetry. And the blue one is called the minor symmetry. Minor symmetry is easy to argue. The major symmetry comes from the fact that there exists a strain energy function. And now when you look at this expression, you see that it automatically satisfies that. It has to because it comes from a strain energy function. There is the minor and there is the uh, major symmetry. Okay? So that's a quite nice um, um, result. Okay, so we've come actually in a short time quite a long way and now suppose we take this idea and pick an example and calculate the macroscopic stiffness tensor, look at its components, try to deduce the parameters that we are already familiar with, let's say the shear modulus, and then compare it with experimental data and see how well this assumption is doing, okay? Now, we have to, or how well this result is doing, and we have to realize that we've made a number of assumptions. We've assumed, uh, at this stage at least, pair potentials. We've assumed the Cauchy-Born hypothesis, and these are, these are strong assumptions, right? So we don't expect to nail the experimental results, but it would be nice to see if we fall into the ballpark, right? If we get any meaningful results at all. Right? Um, so, Let's proceed with one such example that I borrowed from a reference. And actually, this will give me a chance to also uh, clarify one, perhaps, uh, one thing that I promised again I would do that I, that I realized I didn't, and also uh, something else that might have misled you a little bit um, about the expression for the macroscopic stiffness tensor in Foyt notation, okay? So I'll um, make, let me say, as I did here, some augmentations to the lecture on linear elasticity on the fly. Um, so this is our example. Uh, what we're going to look at is, a, is the bulk single crystal. So at least for experimental comparison, that's what we are going to compare against, of silicon. Okay? And silicon has apparently a diamond crystal lattice. I'm sorry, diamond cubic crystal lattice. 
um, it's a cubic crystal lattice, and therefore we know that it is subject to, to cubic symmetry. It displays cubic symmetry, so it has three independent elastic constants. Okay. So let's say the Young's modulus, the Poisson ratio, and the shear modulus. And the shear modulus is not related to the first two because of the cubic symmetry. Okay. Um, all right, so we have E nu and mu not equal to E over 2, 1 plus mu. Um, instead of looking at those three constants, we can actually pick any three, as I've said before. For instance, you can pick the bulk modulus, shear modulus, and uh, let's say the Poisson ratio, or the uh, Lame constant, and mu, and shear modulus, etc. So any three would do. So for the purpose of this example, let's pick the three constants that appear in the Voigt notation, the six by six notation of the stiffness tensor, so I'm picking the matrix component C11, C12, they have to be the ones that are linearly independent, and C44. Okay. Now, if we had isotropy, there would be a relation among these constants. If we had isotropy in particular, C112 would be 2 mu plus lambda, um, C12 would be lambda, and C44 would be mu, which in this case it's still equal to mu. Okay? So C44, if you look at the um, matrix, the C, stiffness matrix for cubic symmetry, C44, C55, C66 are non zero and they're equal to mu. All right? Um, so for the case of isotropy, the remaining ones would be equal to those, okay? So now, what I told you I would do at least once is, at least in one specific case, I, I, I told you I would give you a direct expression for C11 in terms of the actual components of the stiffness tensor C, I, J, K, L. And at that time, I told you that, well, okay, so in general, it would be some linear combination of those values, but I, I was misleading. I really meant to say that in general they would be linear combinations of elastic constants that we are familiar with. It turns out that the, and you can find this in any standard reference, the components of the stiffness matrix, every one of those components corresponds to just one component of the stiffness tensor. So for instance, um, C111 is precisely equal to C11 is equal to C111, okay? C12, and this is irrespective of whether we have isotropy or any form of actually isot anisotropy, has this um, matching between the fourth order and the matrix components. 2, 3, 2, 3, okay? And for that matter, any other matrix component corresponds to just one component of the fourth order tensor, okay? So I told you I would give you one example, and that is one example, all right? Okay, so now, going back to our argument. Uh, we have a cubic lattice structure. I'm going to monitor these three components. The last one com comes out to be mu. The other two is what I'm going to extract by calculating C111, C1122. And that comes from that expression that I just tried, the fourth order stiffness tensor on the macro scale. So I'll calculate their corresponding components, okay? Indicate them as such in matrix form, and I'm going to tabulate them here, all right? So let's do that. I'm not doing it, of course. The reference that I borrowed it from has done it. So C11, C12, and C44. Four, four. 
Um, so now looking at this expression, eventually I have a cubic lattice. And because I have a cubic lattice, the blue expressions for these two at least, they don't necessarily, they don't hold. And therefore, if I take C12 and subtract it from C11 and divide it by two, four isotropes, well, I would get two mu plus lambda minus lambda, two mu divided by two mu, divided by C44, I should get a one if it's isotropic. But it's not isotropic, so I shouldn't get a one because it's cubic. So I'm going to write that here, C11 minus C12 divided by 2C44. Okay. And this is um, what one can presently refer to as the N isotropy ratio. And it's equal to 1 for isotropy. Good. And now let's look at the results. First, we have experiments. Then we have computation. And here I'm going to have yet another computation, but let's postpone that for the time being. Right, so these three are in GPA, and that's what you would expect for a material such as this, stiffness tensor components of the order of GPA. Um, and the experiment tells you that you have here 165.6, 63.9, 65.9, 79.6, and you calculate the anisotropy ratio, it's not one, it's rather 0 0.64. Okay. Now then, one does computation. And the way we're going to do computation is based on the Cauchy-Born hypothesis by invoking some potential. Now the potential, however, that is involved in this particular example is not the Leonard Jones potential. It's something call, called the Tersolf potential. And I'll just, in fact, specifically write what it corresponds to. It's called the Tersolf T3 potential. It's not Leonard Jones. And I made a quick check. It's not really a pair potential per se either. It looks into more than pairs. It looks out at pairs of pairs as well as it tries to figure out what the interaction potential is. But skipping the details of that potential aside, as soon as you invoke that, the rest of the calculations is based on the essentially the Cauchy-Born hypothesis. Okay? So if any modification is required for the implementation of this, that would be a minor one for our purposes. And then you can go pr along the procedure that we described. So what you have to do is, right, somebody either needs to tell you, based on the tersol potential, what the initial equilibrium configuration of this diamond cubic crystal lattice is, or you do some simple molecular dynamics and find out the equilibrium lattice. And once you do that, you know what the referential relative position vectors are. You know the interaction potential. You plug it into the stiffness tensor expression, and you evaluate it. Done. And then you extract the components, C1111, C1122, C2323, and plug them in there. Right? And the results are 142.6, 75.4, and 118.8. And you calculate the anisotropy ratio, it's 0 0.28. So, how are we doing? It's, it's not terrible. We are in the ballpark, right? So, remember, so what we're doing is we, we are using a potential that is somehow tuned to this particular material. It has some, it has actually compared to the Leonard Jones a lot of constants that you can at least tune um, uh, for 
some particular reference cases and then take it and put in two of these cases to this particular case that you're interested in. And now you are fairly certain that that potential is representing to some good accuracy uh, or reasonable accuracy the behavior of box single crystal silicon. And we're making use of it, right? But we re we're invoking it in the context of Cauchy-Born hypothesis, right? So there's certainly a, still an error coming from the potential because it's not the full reality. And plus, there's an error coming from the Cauchy-Born hypothesis. Everything else we've done is almost exact, right? Almost exact. And it's a simple, or let me say a neat, uh, theoretical derivation, and we've come pretty close to the experimental observations, right? So that, that I think is already remarkable. Now, however, there is some room for um, improvement. In fact, let's say it's some room for relaxation, to give you a key word. And what we discussed last time was that, well, okay, you have your initial crystal piece, and that crystal piece, let's say, has guidelines there, and then it deforms from the referential configuration to the spatial configuration, and we are here invoking the Cauchy-Born hypothesis, which says that that deformation is uniform. But this is not necessarily true, and in fact, I told you last time that the reality could be, at least for complex crystals in general, is that there is going to be some internal motion. In other words, you have to make sure that on the deformed configuration, every atom experiences a net force of zero. The Cauchy-Born hypothesis does not guarantee that. So what you can do is you can, if you like, take a large crystal piece. On the surface, you can impose such a deformation as one simple scenario. But on the inside, you can do some relaxations. You can let the atoms not follow the Cauchy-Born hypothesis, but move to the equilibrium position. So that's going to be called, let's say, internal relaxation. And therefore, you will get a picture where internally, and I'll just exaggerate like this, there is some relaxation. There are also other boundary conditions you could impose on this large piece of crystal. It has to be large, right? Uh, uh, that was in our derivation. But once it's sufficiently large, there are other boundary conditions that would implicitly also let the boundary relax. Okay? Uh, but once you do that properly, and that is computationally a little bit now expensive, uh, uh, but, but um, it's something you can uh, certainly um, carry out. Then what you obtain is a result that is slightly better, right? So now that is the end of our fourth special topic. And it goes in a reasonable series. No deformation rigid by dynamics, small elastic deformation, linear elasticity, large deformation, soft matter mechanics, which allowed us to experiment with um, the concept of strain energy function that is important for mechanical consistency, essentially. And now we're come, we've covered a topic where all of those sort of interact with each other. And additionally, what we've seen is a way to circumvent the macroscopic phenomenological approach where, uh, or experimental approach where you would have to measure these constants. Instead, now we are calculating what those constants are. Okay. Um, next time, what I'd like to do is now move to um, fluid mechanics and just cover that also a little bit and see how um, the, uh, let me say, basic formulations of fluid mechanics are, uh, let me say, interacting with the framework of continuum mechanics. And I think after dynamics and some basic solid mechanics followed by, let me say, some multi-scale ideas and material science, that would be a nice additional topic where we address fluid dynamics, right?